Apparently Theodore Roosevelt wanted to bring hippos to America so we could eat them. Like, for real, I'm not just some lunatic on the street shouting non sequiturs here, okay? Like, there were, like, big plans and proposals about this in Congress. This was a prevailing issue of the day. So I guess we're talking about that now. In the crazy, bustling world of the United States in the early years of the 20th century, the government was getting antsy. Immigration was reaching record highs, and the population boom in the U.S. was leading to a major meat shortage. And it wasn't for lack of trying on the meat industry's part. The ranchers of the nation could surely breed more animals, therefore upping the production of harvestable meat, but this requires resources like land. Animals need to eat food, and that food has to grow somewhere. So the meat industry was faced with a challenge. Feed the growing masses of people demanding meat, but do so without setting aside more land for raising livestock. Manifest Destiny had been fulfilled at this point, so they couldn't just push westward and obtain more land. They would have to solve this problem with the real estate that the United States already owned. Perhaps the pastures and fields that we use for cattle grazing weren't the only medium suitable for the job. Meanwhile, Louisiana Congressman Robert Brassard noted the trouble that his state was seeing with the water hyacinth, an invasive plant species that was running wild and chasing waterfalls. Sorry, clogging waterways. Enter the hippopotamus, an enormous, chubby, adorable creature that also happens to be able to crush your head the way you'd pop a grape. The horrific danger of the hippo notwithstanding, Congressman Broussard floated the idea of killing two birds with one stone. And people were like, bro, that was a sick shot, but why are you harming my parakeets, you monster? But anyway, he wanted to send hippopotamuses into the swamps and bayous of the American South. For one, this would be a somewhat familiar environment for the behemoths to live in, and being herbivores, they would ostensibly just eat the water hyacinths. I mean, right? Right? Thus converting the troublesome plants into delicious, delicious hippo meat. One big problem, of course, with that plan, other than its surreal, wily coyote-level hair-brainedness, was the fact that hippos, native to Africa, are not known to eat aquatic plants, especially not ones that were originally found in South America, which they would have never had any occasion to come across. Instead, they're largely known to graze on land, preferring short grass, shoots, and reeds. And watermelons, I guess. In practicality aside, Broussard brought in a handful of experts to promote his idea. Now here's where it gets interesting. Two of the experts that Broussard brought before Congress to pitch his hippo meat plan were, fair warning, kind of like what would happen if a cheesy Golden Age comic book and that blimp dude from the movie Up had some kind of unholy offspring and it was raised by Ninja Turtles. If you consider these guys in the context of their time, and being honest, maybe ignore some of the problematic imperialism that they were both a part of, They were both so larger than life, and such interesting characters. So interesting, in fact, that tried to convince Americans to eat hippos only receives a collective four sentences between both of their Wikipedia pages. The first is Frederick Russell Burnham. It's a wonder that Burnham's not more widely known, seeing as he's strongly considered by many to be the real-life historical inspiration for both Indiana Jones and Alan Quartermain. Oh hey, same actor. Burnham's greatest hits include being the sole breadwinner of his family by the age of 12, delivering messages for the Western Union Telegraph Company and evading outlaws at age 14, spending his teenage years being taught by frontiersmen, mountain men, and scouts in the American West, becoming a spy and a hired gun for the British Army to fight colonial wars in Africa, the Boer Wars detonating railway bridges and escaping from capture twice during the Second Boer War, 
also known as Boar War II. This time it's not boring. Notable archaeological discoveries pertaining to the ancient Mayans. Disarming an assassin within feet of killing President Taft. Obtaining the nickname He Who Sees in the Dark for his tracking abilities. Oh, you thought that was hardcore? Well, it gets even better. Because the other expert who happened to have comparable experience with both Africa and hippos was a man named Fritz Duquesne. As fate would have it, this was not even the first time that Burnham and Duquesne had met each other. Because you see, Duquesne was a German man who fought on the other side of the Second Boer War, and the two men had mutually been assigned to kill each other during that conflict. <clears throat> Duquesne's greatest hits include killing a man with his own sword for trying to attack Duquesne's mother at age 12? Oh my word, that is traumatic. Anyway, traveling the world with an embezzler after finishing secondary school. Infiltrating the British Army as a spy in the Second Boer War, becoming a British officer and sabotaging several operations, even leading other soldiers in an attempt to assassinate a superior officer, Lord Kitchener. I think that's actually a Fallout Boy song, come to think of it. Escaping numerous prisons, including three separate occasions of escaping capture in the Second Boer War. Becoming a con man and spy with about 30 known aliases. Earning equally hardcore nicknames as Burnham, including the Black Panther for his stealth. All these can be yours today for the low price of your sanity. Call now! Duquesne was eventually captured by the British in the Boer War a final time, which he nearly escaped by digging a tunnel with a spoon. No joke. But he was foiled in that attempt. He was sent from there to a prison in Bermuda, which he, of course, escaped from, and <laughs> fled to America, where he became a citizen. And that's where he met up with his sworn enemy and pitched to Congress the idea of hippo ranching. But why would either of these old-timey adventurers join forces with their nemesis? Well, it just so happens that these two were so bad that they were those Professor X Magneto type of enemies that had earned each other's begrudging respect. Able to have a cup of coffee together now despite swearing to stab each other's brains out in the past. Duquesne is quoted as saying, I once craved the honor of killing him, but failing that, I extend my heartiest admiration. The feeling was apparently mutual, according to Burnham, who said, He was one of the craftiest men I ever met. He had something of the genius of the Apache, for avoiding a combat except in his own terms. Yet he would be the last man I should choose to meet in a dark room for a finished fight armed only with knives. Something tells me he's had more than one of those fights. So these dudes sound quite convincing. What? came of this insane proposal. As you can probably tell, the American South is not overrun with herds of hippos stomping through Cracker Barrel and devouring NASCAR fans. I mean, what gives? Why can't I get a burger potamus or a six-pack of hearty hippo nuggets? The answer to that question is much less interesting than the espionage and outlandish proposals that preceded it. In short, the proposal simply just faded from the collective consciousness of Congress, and the meat shortage was solved by farmers finding new ways to raise animals in more places and raise more animals in one place, eventually creating a crisis of its own from the ecological and ethical problems of the factory farming nightmare that we have right now. A whole story unto itself. As far as the epitomes of old school manliness and adventure who proposed the hippo solution, things ended far more interestingly. Burnham and his survival talents would become the inspiration for the Boy Scouts of America, as well as for countless fictional adventurers who came close to his level of real-life swarthy awesomeness. And Duquesne? That's where it gets a bit more touchy. True to his two-timing conman ways and a lifelong hatred of the British for their role in killing his family in the Second Boer War, Duquesne eventually became a spy for the Germans in both world wars. By the end of World War II, the FBI discovered Duquesne's secret spy ring, and he and 33 others were arrested and convicted by the United States for espionage. To this day, this bust is considered the largest espionage case in United States history that has led to a conviction. And there you have it, a story that literally has everything. Adventure, daring escapes, large semi-aquatic mammals, assassinations, betrayal, and a real-life equivalent of an action hero supervillain team-up. Also, we could eat hippos. I don't get it. 
Thanks for watching, guys. I appreciate you joining in on my madness. If you like weird history, absurd science, or just, I don't know, whatever the heck this is, consider subscribing? Or liking the video? Maybe? Follow me on Twitter at quest underscore Shans or Instagram at quest Shans. Until I see you next, keep questioning.